Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. As you can see, this time we're looking at an A500. Now, it's just a bare motherboard, and there are no chips uh, socketed. Uh, you know, all the sockets are empty here. Um, it's one of the later revisions to this, because it's got the extra uh, slots here uh, for the uh, one meg. So you can add four more chips there and take it up to one meg. So I'm not sure what uh, version of Agnes it would have had, actually. Uh, I need to check that. It's uh, a Rev6A, actually. Uh, B52 Rob Lobster. So I've got uh, a load of spare chips actually. I think I've probably got enough for two spare Amigas actually. We've got no battery or anything on here, but there are a few uh, dark coloured pins. So one or two of the sockets may need replacing. Uh, it looks like the uh, Agnes socket is okay there. Someone actually used the correct tool to remove the Agnes. Uh, that's surprising. Uh, there is some co corrosion here, can you see? A little bit greenish. That's indicative that uh, the memory uh, expansion that was in here had a battery and it leaked and it must have just affected that. But I doubt that's the problem. I suspect we're going to be looking at probably the data path uh, or the RAM. The nice thing with this is I've only got uh, four chips for the RAM, so it's uh, a lot easier to work with than some of the older A500s because they've got like 16 chips on there and it's an absolute nightmare dealing with those. So yeah, in the first instance, I'm just going to populate the sockets here. So we'll get Gary in first. You can see we've got uh, some green looking pins there. So, uh, socket at the connectors I should say. So we'll stick CIA in next. Do the odd one. And another 8520 over here. Another CIA. The even one this time. Let's move that cap a little bit. We go both CIAs in. So we'll get Paula in next. Uh, pin one uh, to the side there. And again, you can see some green looking pins actually. Some green looking uh, connections there. I might get some deoxid or something for this. So uh, the next one's Denise uh, 8362R8. I think that's uh, Denise. Uh, I've got some Super Denise Denise's somewhere. Again, we've got what looked like uh, some corrosion in there, but uh, yeah, we'll give it a go anyway. Because uh, I suspect it's not going to make too much difference as it is. I'll remove the chips and clean up later. Am I getting that around the wrong way? I am. Pin one, pin one is down here. Huge, these 68,000s. I was always amazed at the size of these uh, back in the day. And then I've got a kickstart 1.2 here, so we'll just push that in. So the final thing here to populate this now is uh, an Agnes. So I just need to work out what revision would have uh, sat on this board. Is it an 8371 or an 8372 or what? I'm guessing an 8372. So I had one of those camcorder moments there where I forgot to uh, press record. Well, in fact, I actually pressed stop. So you can see you've got an 8372A here. Um, it's worth doing this on an ESD mat where ESD wrist straps when you're doing this, handling these chips. Um, pin one is on this side here, you know, it's this side of the socket. There's a little chamfered edge there, and you can see the little pin one uh, marking there. So it needs to go this way into the socket. So the technique here is to get it perfectly lined up like that. Inspect the pins before you put it in, because sometimes they can get slightly bent to the sides, you know, in transit and things like that, when they've been stored in the incorrect containers and things, you know, knocking around, banging against other chips and things like that. So make sure all the pins are all straight, get it nice and straight like that, and just push it in carefully, like that. That's it. It's in. Um, now, the nice thing with this socket... You can push this out from the other side, I'll show you that in a second. But you're supposed to use a PLCC extractor, it's a special tool, I've got one, I've not got it to hand, I might show in one of the upcoming videos. Um, yeah, you just push it into the little slots there and you squeeze it and it grabs the underneath and you pull it out. Crazy people use a screwdriver to try and leave it out from the corners here, you will smash the edges of the socket. That happens uh, very, uh, you know, very frequently on these old sockets because the plastic hasn't aged well. But you can see what I mean about the two holes underneath, you know, if you've not got a PLCC extractor, you could, and I don't like doing this, we'll do it anyway. Uh, you could use uh, something with a, a flat edge, if you can, and just push down a little bit, not hard, and a little bit there, not hard, there we go. Tip it up, and you can see the chip has come out. So, yeah, that's one way of getting them back out if you've not got a PLCC extractor, but again, 
it's not the recommended way of doing it. Get yourself a PLCC extractor. Uh, so we'll just inspect the uh, pins again there, just to make sure those are all okay. Yeah, there's a bit of dirt or something there on that one. I'll just try and clean that with the fiberglass pen, actually, because if we have a bad connection there, it's going to cause all sorts of problems. Yeah, it was a bit of corrosion, I think, actually, that. Yeah, that's looking a bit better. So again, we'll just fit that at the same time. Let's make sure it's perfectly aligned. And it is. And just push it down. Like that. That's it. All done. So I did just have to tinker with that jumper there. But, uh, yeah, I'm surprised. Just watch this. Right, you ready? You know what mine looks like. So, yeah, memory test, grey, then white. Oh, hang on, software failure. That's positive, actually, we have got problem I was gonna say it is working uh, now this could be uh, those bad connections it could well be uh, RAM I don't know it's strange I would get that so soon into the boot there it could have a dodgy Agnes <coughs> okay so it's not a complete disaster because what was happening it was coming straight up with the uh, it's doing it now it's got a boot I think and it's a 1.3 ROM I've got actually, not 1.2, which I'm surprised at. I'm sure I only had a 1.2, there you go. The Mega Workbench 1.3. Uh, so I'm surprised at that. I didn't know I had that. So it would appear it's uh, intermittent. Uh, and I, as I say, I think it's going to be uh, RAM or data path, actually. And it seems to be working pretty consistently now, actually. What I will need to do is get mine out of the loft actually so that I can connect a keyboard up and a uh, floppy drive. But for the most part it does seem to be working. I saw this when it arrived but I forgot to mention. Can you see that resistor there? It's burnt out. Yeah, it's a common problem. I think, is it that the disk drive or the f uh, serial port? I'm not sure. And, um, you use the wrong cable, you short a couple of pins and yeah, you can burn that out. Yeah, I suspect the problem is going to be in this area here, or one of these four RAM chips. And actually, just thinking about things, I don't think there's going to be feed and a connection there. That's going to be a supply. It's going to be uh, providing the supply to these connectors, I think. I think one's going to be for each port, because there's a few of those 47 ohm resistors there. Uh, and I've measured it, and it's okay. Um, so it's probably started to burn up, um, and then didn't fail. But we'll remove it anyway. Um, and I will just uh, pay attention to you know how that's wired, but as I say, I suspect that's probably feeding the 12 volts or the 5 volts or something, probably the 12 I would think, uh, to one of the connectors up there. And there you go, I've removed it. So the easy way to do that was uh, just to heat from the underside uh, and then just get a small tool underneath and just lift one side up at a time, you know, as, it, as the solder melts on the pin. Uh, because the, it was absorbing quite a bit of heat, that actually, uh, but as you can see, it is uh, burnt out, even though it measures okay, yeah, you wouldn't want to leave that in there. So the next thing I'm going to do as I'm working around the board here is just having an inspection, uh, move any components that are close to each other and short in, like there were a couple, I'll show you, there's a couple of caps there, they were almost short and I just separated them, uh, you know, just gently move them away from each other, move them to the sides. But you can see down here we've got some, just a little bit of corrosion on a couple of fires. I'm going to clean those up either by just very carefully scratching the surface like this with a very fine tool, uh, just gently. You don't want to, you know, break the connections to or from them. Um, and they'll get some flux on them. We'll get some solder and just reflow them, or use a fiberglass pen. But the problem with the fiberglass pen is it affects the wider area. You know, these are so small. I can just focus on the tops of those little vias with this tool here like that, and uh, get them back to a metal surface. Uh, and just remove any of the corrosion there on the trace and like I say get some flux solder, solder braid with a bit of solder on it and just dra you know drag the solder braid uh, as you heat it over there and it'll just tin the tops of those but there aren't very many there's just a few round there uh, I thought I saw one somewhere else as well but it's looking okay yeah so a super close example here of what I mean uh, I'm using magnifying glass to do this but we could just scratch around that via there uh, and scratch some of this here because there's just a little bit, can you see, uh, of corrosion just on there. I probably will go over this lightly with a fiberglass pen afterwards.
what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of damage here just to a minimum you know the area we're affecting there's no point in uh, like I say using a fiberglass pen and going all around the affected area and making it all look messy because it is quite localized the, the corrosion there that's that's more or less it now I could probably just go over that lightly with a fiberglass pen uh, and then reflow that one and there's a slightly better angle can you see all I've done is focus just on that one via there and if we go over that with a fiberglass pen now, uh, just gently. And then we'll use a cotton bud and some IPA. Uh, and then we'll just tin it up. Yeah, that's not too bad, can you see? She needs a little bit more cleaning up, but we're almost there. There you go, so you can just about see that at a distance. You can see the little rings there where the fiberglass pen has been used to... Uh, get rid of the rust and if I just clean that up yeah look how dirty that is it's really bad I mean bear in mind there's going to be lots of little rust particles there so those will need mopping up now uh, I will go over that with the uh, uh, toothbrush and stuff and some more IPA afterwards but you can see we're back to bare metal there now uh, and it's nice and tidy they've got no rust around uh, those connections at all I mean there's only that one trace the one I focused on initially there that uh, you know this one here that would be an issue or these little ones uh, but the corrosion there was super light actually on those other vias it's just this one here um, those are obviously just like ground stitching you know straight through the ground plane there to the other side they're not really that important so I've not got my normal solder and plugged in at the moment so I'm just going to use the uh, uh, desolder tool here I mean the nice thing using the desolder station, I can suck away the old solder actually on the, the via there. Yeah, the solder on the ground stitch in there doesn't look as good as I would like, but yeah, we've got a we had a bad connection here actually. The the trace was not joining the pad, the pad had a bit of corrosion all the way around it, so that could have been an issue. Uh, and then I've reflowed one or two of the vias around there, cleaned up. Um, this jumper down here, it looked like someone had broken it and then soldered some wires on. So I've joined that back up. I'm not sure whether that's right. I need to check the uh, service diagram for this, you know, the service manual. And it's the same thing down here. They've broken the connection. There was a few bits of wires stuck on. So I've cleaned that all off and, uh, you know, shorted the bottom two contacts, which uh, I think is correct. Bear in mind I'm using the monochrome composite output at the moment. It takes a few seconds to uh, boot that. Yeah. See, so it's, it's reliable. Obviously, I need to, you know, get a drive uh, and keyboard connected up, load some games and things. But I suspect, uh, oh, there we go, we've got a Guru Meditation there. Yeah, and again. Uh, now, bear in mind, like I say, I'm, I'm not sure on the absolute status of the chips that I'm using here, because they did all come from, uh, you know, spares. Um, it's all tested working but you never know and I never tested them back at the time when I got them I think what I might do is uh, get the uh, debug uh, BIOS you know diagnostics BIOS uh, for this connect up via the serial port and uh, just test the RAM maybe that would be a good test to do uh, I'm waiting for some chips. I think these use 27C1024, same as the Neo Geo actually, because it's 16 bit uh, EEPROM there. Uh, yeah, I think we'll give that a try. So, whilst I'm waiting for that uh, EEPROM to arrive, uh, I'll have a go at uh, cleaning up that expansion connector actually. The interesting thing is, just thinking about that uh, Guru meditation we're seeing. It seems to be consistently the same value coming back, actually, which would seem to suggest, can you see that? That's coming off. I just needed to clean, because uh, gold doesn't generally uh, tarnish. Um, although there's probably a few bits like that there where it's, it's going to need some more work. I oh, know it's coming off. It's coming off. It just needs a clean look. Uh, yeah, I'm amazed, actually, how well it's coming up. Um, yeah, so the fact we're getting a consistent value coming back there with the Guru Meditation uh, doesn't make me think there is some sort of hardware you know, there is a hard fault somewhere 
uh, at the moment uh, we're not uh, you know understanding uh, it could just be RAM I have seen these with RAM causes that you don't get the green screen like you would expect to see from the BIOS RAM check um, instead you just get uh, weird guru things and stuff and I've seen on 500s where you don't get a RAM error at all on the uh, the BIOS test but as soon as you boot games up you start to get strange things you know crashes glitches graphics looking incorrect etc and you reboot it you never see a green screen it's uh, it goes to show that the diagnostics uh, on uh, these systems and the third party diagnostics are only as good as the way they were written uh, you know they, they never test every single uh, thing that you would think of um, in relationship to RAM for example um, and things obviously change as the system starts to become utilised in different ways and you know all sorts of things become factors. Uh, so you know the data path could be an issue here. We might be getting a really intermittently glitchy data path that's uh, only uh, erroring, you know, only causing a problem on a certain uh, scenario, you know, a certain scenario. It's looking alright that. It still looks a bit green on this side here, but the top side there, I don't know if you can see, uh, has come up super clean actually. So after about 20 minutes of scrubbing there, uh, just with, uh, well I use some vinegar as well, but mostly IPA, you can see it's come off. Um, one or two of the pins on the underside, the technique really was to use this tool again and just to gently touch the surface and the green stuff was just coming off, it was just falling off. Uh, but yeah, that's come out pretty clean on both sides, yeah it looks almost good as new that actually. Incidentally if you spotted that resistor there, that's a factory mod. Uh, yeah, these boards uh, are well known for having uh, various mods uh, like that. We can just straighten that up because can you see the leg looks a little bit bent? Uh, yeah. So yeah, we can just gently straighten that like that. That looks a bit better now. So the little bit of corrosion around the gallery was uh, easy to deal with actually. You know, in the pins there, you can see there's three or four or five pins in there, and this is all I did with the gallery is uh, just get a bit of IPA in there. Ideally you would want to replace the socket, if certainly if the corrosion is uh, pretty bad. But on these you could just you know clean around like this, you know, up bounce up and down to get the uh, uh, bristles to go into the pins there uh, and just have a really good scrub around. You might want to use some vinegar before you use some IPA but uh, actually you know when it's really relatively minor uh, you can get away with uh, just doing this actually, uh, you know, just give it a really good clean, use a, a few, uh, give it a few rinses and things. I don't think this socket's the problem with this. Uh, this one I might swap, Paula is one that I might swap, because just having cleaned this up now, I can still see there's a few dark uh, looking pins there, actually. Um, and the other thing we'll need to do is clean up this uh, Paula. Can you see, this is the Paula I've been using here. It's one of my spares collection. Can you see, it's just a little bit, uh, it's got some oxidisation or corrosion or something up there. So you can just, uh, you know, just gently with a fibreglass pen, uh, just go over the corners and the edges there and uh, it should just remove that oxidisation. So the next thing to clean up here is the uh, expansion connector. The interesting thing is, it looks like it's been used that. It's got little marks on it as if to say something's been uh, mated with that at some point. But we'll just use a soft eraser here uh, and you can see, you know, it gets those little marks off and then we'll go over it with some IPA. Uh, perhaps use the eraser a second time and then use the IPA a second time as well. But the idea is here, what you don't want to do is uh, lose the gold plating. And uh, if you just gently press on with the rubber like this, you tend to get the dirt off and leave the gold plating in place. If you do use a fiberglass pen, as I demonstrated in that uh, King of Fighters uh, Saturn cart uh, video, that was a, a test because I had a number of people saying you should use a fiberglass pen, it's far easier than using a razor. And I wanted to just uh, see what the benefits or pros or cons were, and yeah, it removes the gold plate if you use a fiberglass pen. Bit of uh, IPA here on a rag. Uh, you can see, can you see that? It's, you, you get like a coating of rubber, not just the dirt that uh, is on there as well, but you get the rubber uh, sort of coming off there as, on the surface. So it is a good idea to wipe it a couple of times at least with some IPA, but you can see that's coming up a lot cleaner. A 
quick update on the previous power supply repair here. Um, there were one or two comments that suggested replacing these two as a precaution. You know, those two that are, you know, obviously they've heated the board up pretty significantly there. And that's a really good idea. And somebody else actually pointed out, why not just leave the extra long legs on the new resistors so that these stand off the board by a certain height. And again, that's a good idea. If you're going to do that, you can get like a little piece of insulation tubing. You could use heat shrink tubing for the legs just to stop them, you know, because the, the component could bend over or get knocked over from the whack or something like that. So you want those legs to be isolated, but you could do that. You could swap those out with new 47 ohm resistors there. You know, have the legs stood off quite a high distance off the board and have some tubing of some sort on the length of the legs there. But yeah, I'm going to swap that cap out. I'm not going to bore you with all of this, but you can see, you know, I've removed the old cap there. 47 microfarad, 385 volts. Got some nice new Panasonic here, 105 degrees uh, CE series. 47 microfarad, 400 volts. So, you know, look at the size difference, you know, modern caps compared to these older ones. You know, it's a higher voltage. Um, higher temperature rating, that one was 85 degrees. We'll check that on the cap meter in a minute, but yeah, I'm just gonna solder that on, so. Nothing particularly exciting, but you know what? There were a few people um, probably thinking, yeah, I bet he doesn't swap that cap out. Yeah, you have little faith. So I say, I usually do what I say I'm gonna do. Not always in the same order. <laughs> I often do things in completely different order that I say I'm gonna do things, but um, yeah, my intention was always to swap that cap. And on my capacitance meter there, 52 microfarads versus the 47 is marked at. So, you know what, it's within spec. I could test the ESR on one of those cheap testers, but I'll guarantee that is still within, uh, you know, working uh, tolerances. So at the moment, I don't have a keyboard to test this with, uh, but I know, let's use the Atari ST keyboard. And you straight away you're thinking, what? This guy's absolutely crazy. You can't use an Atari ST keyboard uh, with an Amiga. Uh, but actually you can. Um, one of the nice things with Amiga Diagram is the it outputs via the serial port actually. So I've made a uh, basic serial cable. Is it a null uh, modem cable? I think it is. It's, yeah, pins two. Two goes to three, three goes to two. You know, so they're flipped, the receiving transmit pins, and then a ground. Uh, I've got those connected up to the ST, so if I switch the ST on, so apologies the screen's at a bit of a strange angle. Uh, now there is an issue actually, the terminal software I'm using on the ST here, this ANSI uh, version 1.90 I think it is, is a bit flaky. Uh, you'll see what I mean. If we set the board rate to 9600, uh, there we go, put the board again. So that's that aspect done. Um, I've got the uh, Elgato connected up here as well actually so that I can see on my main monitor the actual Amiga's display output and if I switch the Amiga on you will see we get the diagnostic stuff coming up and it should give us the option here um, in fact it jumped straight past, that's one thing I have noticed there seems to be some anomaly there on the controls it's supposed to wait and say you know if you want to uh, use the serial hold down or click the right mouse button or else click the left button etc that doesn't happen. So whilst you saw the display go crazy on the ST there, the ST is still in control. I can still send commands actually via the ST. So this is uh, the, ma the main monitor here. We're looking at the composite output via my um, Elgato. Uh, and if I do say memory test 2, I'm typing on the ST keyboard here. You can see we've gone into the uh, menu there. So I'll just turn the camera a little bit. And if we do, uh, let's do an extended chip mem test. Two. So you're a little bit close. If we just pull the camera back a little bit, you can see uh, that's actually starting to test. Uh, on the ST, we've just got a blank screen, and occasionally it'll you'll see the whole thing, the whole screen will just like flicker past. So it's like there's uh, some sort of incompatibility there with some of the control, uh, you know, the escape codes and things that are going across. But I can use my normal display here. And as you can see, you know, we can keep track of the progress just using the, the Amiga's own video output. So that's really sweet. So the interesting thing is at the end of that, you can see we've got some issues here. I'm sorry the camera's wobbling a bit, I'm having to hold it. It says address error detected. Uh, DB data of the CPU registers. And then you've got IRQ level one points to blah, 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 blah. It's that bit at the bottom, is 1114 readable at address 0, 1 still at 0, no. Is 114 readable at address F8, 0000, real ROM address, yes. So I'm not quite sure what to make of that actually. Um, 
it's kind of out of my uh, realm of knowledge in terms of what I'm actually looking at there. But I'm suspecting, you know, I do think the um, data path, it's got to be the fault. I, I don't think we get address errors and things with faulty RAM. It's uh, it's going to be that data path. Um, you know, there is a chance that one of the other chips in this board is faulty, i.e. the Agnes. Um, but I don't think so. So if I press 1, you can see it's uh, doing the memory test there now. So if we just let that go through, you should be able to see uh, sort of up there, uh, zero uh, errors, I think it says, error zero. Three hundred nineteen k. No errors. So that seems to work. Press return on the ST. Back to the main menu. Uh, so we, I mean, we can do other things. We can, if we go back to the main menu, zero. Uh, and as I say, I'm using the ST for this. Uh, three IRQ CIA tests. Let's try that. Test the IRQs. I think one of these you need to have a wire connected to or something. Yeah, testing IRQ level seven will fail unless you don't press a custom IRQ button. Uh, but all the other IRQs worked okay. Let's test the CIAs, presumably the timers and things in them. Uh, it requires a level 3 IRQ. I check if your CIAs can time stuff. So there you go. So we got you can see some noise or something in the background. It's, you know, it's doing something with the display there with the CIAs. It's super useful though, because it means it can go through some of the CIAs actually to test those. Uh, now, main menu, graphics test, and I've tested all this stuff previously, I'll just do that single image, there you go, you can see that works okay, hit a key, uh, I'm not going to do the second one because that uh, seems to freak my ST out actually completely, uh, but it works, the second one. In fact, let's do that second one, there you go, yeah, it's alright, it works okay this time, the ST's uh, handled it. Nine back to the main menu. Uh, so I, mean, I could connect the audio up. I've not got speakers here, but I've tested that. That works okay. So it would appear, that as far as uh, diagram uh, is concerned, everything works fine. So it, it leaves me with a bit of a mystery as to what's actually going on. So there are a few other things I want to mention while we're on this part of the repair series here. The jumper two there, I had to uh, you know, resolder that. Can you see where that is at the moment? It's in the lower position. That was set incorrectly. Um, it was, in fact, it was just completely open circuit. I presume at some point someone perhaps had a, a wire on there because there is a mod you can do. I forget what it is, but you can yeah you can use that jumper to switch. I think it's uh, related to the uh, control of this ROM here actually. But there's another one down here, and that was set incorrectly as well, 7A. So yeah, I'm not really sure what gone on there, but that, those were the things I had to do as well as you know the fix to the slightly damaged traces up there. One of them was definitely a break. You know, the smaller one was definitely a break, and I had a bit of solder to the fire I managed to just uh, I managed to just trail it across you know um, and it's the same with this one here so that, yeah, I'm not sure what, what, what was actually causing the initial faults with this although as you will see in a you know future video we need to do more for a test and I need, I need to connect a keyboard up floppy drive boot some games run some software I need to work out why I'm getting that address uh, failure when using diagram here I'm suspecting it's going to be something to do with the data path here but, you know, I'm not really out we could have an issue with one of these chips. So the other interesting thing with this particular board, it's a Rev6A. It's got the uh, extra spaces here for another 512K, you know, so it says there 512K, one meg. Uh, I think the 8372A is the one that will allow up to one meg of chip RAM. Um, and the thing that dictates that is obviously is the Agnes here, the 8372A. Agnes uh, does some clock generation as well actually, see the main crystal here, the 26 whatever it is, megahertz is it, 28 point something, 28.375, um, yeah your main uh, clock goes into Agnes and I think Agnes divides that out and perhaps provides uh, a clock to the CPU and various other things, but Agnes is also the memory controller. Um, in terms of memory controls, more of like a DMA controller, really, rather than anything. This memory down here is chip RAM, so this can be addressed by not just the CPU, but by Paula, probably Gary, and Denise. 
So yeah, it's kind of a DNA controller. You know, memory transfers can take place um, in parallel to the CPU doing various things. I mean, obviously you're limited with the RAM you've got on here. You're limited as to when that can occur. And, you know, this is one of the benefits of adding adding fast RAM. You know, if you had a fast RAM module here, 512k fast RAM, that frees up the CPU to maybe run code from that fast RAM, and independently of that, you know, Agnes can uh, allocate uh, the chip RAM access on certain cycles to some of the other chips here. So that's one of the reasons why it was advantageous to add fast RAM to these systems to, you know, um, kind of give the CPU its own dedicated RAM that would not be interfered with, uh, while uh, you know Agnes and you know various other chips and things uh, utilise the uh, the chip RAM. But as I've mentioned on previous Amiga videos I've done, um, Agnes contains a uh, blitzer, you know, a block transfer, bit block transfer. So, you know, she, should we refer to her agenda? Yeah, she can uh, move, uh, you know, large chunks of data from one place to another. I mean, this, it, 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 that sort of stuff goes on hold when the CPU needs access to, I don't know, chip RAM, for example. But then when the CPU is not accessing the chip RAM, the blitzer operation can continue kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it can copy large blocks of data, you know, graphical data. Um, just like you got on the Blitzer on the Atari ST, you know, it's useful for the uh, OS UI stuff and things like that. But you've also got copper built into uh, Agnes there. And the most common thing you've seen with copper in many Amiga games is you get like uh, coloured patterns, you know, coloured bands and things of certain patterns, stripes down the screen. That's all typically done by the copper. But the copper is actually more than I realised. I only realised this recently. It's. Um, kind of like a coprocessor and that's where the copper comes from you know the, the, the nickname copper uh, sort of short for copro um, but it's a finite state machine so it's a it's got a limited number of instructions it's capable of understanding I think but it can basically make calls to various things to do various things Denise is a graphics chip and you've got eight hardware sprites as far as I understand so using Agnes using the coprocessor there the copper what you can do is you can draw a sprite and then mid scan line you can actually redraw that sprite in a different position by use of that uh, coprocessor that's sat in there you know that's how fast it is it can do it within the middle of a scan line you know a part part of a scan line so you can you know effectively get more sprites displayed than you're actually capable of doing so that's a really nice feature actually there are quite a few different versions of Agnes. Um, I think there was um, a dip version of that. Was it on the Amiga 1000? Was that the original version? I think it was, yeah. Um, and again, you know, each one of them has got more or less capability in terms of how much chip RAM they can uh, address. So as I, said, I said, as I said earlier, this one's the 1 meg one. There's uh, a 2 meg one as well. You can't just stick any Agnes in any socket. There are some exceptions, like I think, for example, on some of these boards where you've got the half meg one, you can swap it for the 1 meg one. Uh, and you, there might be some versions out there that have got a specific revision of the 1 meg one where you can swap a 2 meg one. I think actually you probably need some sort of adapter to do that in most instances. So back over to Denise, as I say, Denise is your graphics chip. You can see there's two 74HC245s here. So those are uh, just used to buffer the uh, output to the video hybrid here. So this is just, I don't know what it's doing, it's just tidying up the uh, levels and things. I don't know what it's doing. It's affecting the RGB levels and the, co the sync and stuff that come out to the video port here. Um, someone did produce, I think it was Kipper, Kipper 2K, produced a nice little uh, repro of these hybrid modules that give a slightly better display, but still, it's quite good. Those don't tend to fail. I've never ever seen one fail, but I'm sure they probably do. There's probably examples out there where those, that hybrid does fail there. And a hybrid, if you're not aware, you can just sort of just to see that it's like a little PCB with some components assembled on it with little pins on the bottom to solder it in line onto the PCB. Not quite sure why they did that. Um, I guess it's taking up less space on the board, isn't it, really? It might have been an afterthought. They might have originally with it not had that in the design and thought, well, we really need to do something with the video output. You know, Can we improve it? Well, we can just about fit a strip of pins down there and accommodate this little module. So that's perhaps why we ended up with a hybrid there. Um, yeah, so Denise, uh, eight hardware sprites, I think. You can have two play fields independently, I think. I think one can overlay the other one. I'm not quite sure how that works. I can't even think of any games I've probably seen that in although it probably does get used all over the place um, 32 colors typically there's lots of obviously it's a bit like other system you know the graphics chips and other systems you know you go you can change the resolution of lower color depth you can have a higher color depth if you use the hold and modify I think you can get 64 colors you might be able to get more actually and that's probably going to be relying on some of the techniques of the uh, copper as well so you've got Paula providing the audio here PCM audio 8-bit Four channels, two channels go to the left, two channels go to the right. 
Um, so some people do a mod actually to you know uh, mix. I think it was something Miss Madeleine covered in one of her videos to mix the audio. So I don't know. You get I don't know. Say 25% of the left channel merge with the right channel and vice versa, because then it kind of it sounds a little bit better. Um, you get a very distinct separation on the left and right. You know because obviously two channels are physically on the left, two are physically on the right. You can't sort of merge them anyway in the software. And I think you can get up to something like 29 kilohertz in terms of the sample rate there. So that's pretty good for the time. It was only 8-bit, but you know, still, it's it's really good. Your serial connections go through Paula, strangely enough. Now, I only discovered that from looking at the, the schematics a minute ago. I want to refresh myself with what goes where, what connects, because some of these have got numerous uh, things that they do, you know, it's not just a sound chip. So yeah, your serial, if you look at the pin out of this, you'll see on the schematics RXD and TXD, the serial come through Paula. Now I was going to make the mistake of saying ah oh, the mouse and uh, joystick ports and things go through Paula a bit like the Sid. Uh, that isn't the case. Something I forgot to mention about Denise is Denise has um, the I think a fire button one for both of the controllers and the pot X and pot Y go through here so that's kind of a bit like the way it was done in the Sid. You know, those analog mouse and uh, ports there were done by the SID chip. Well, this isn't the sound chip, that's the sound chip. This is the graphics chip. So it's a bit weird how that works. I think there's, there's more in common with the way the architecture of this, based on the Atari, uh, you know, 8 bit range of things with Antic and all that sort of stuff. You know, there's some similarities there because the people who worked on the Atari 8 bit design are the people who worked on the Amiga. But yeah, your serial connections do come through Paula. Uh, there's also a couple of connections through to Gary as well, which is not something I'd ever noticed until I looked at the schematics. So it looks like uh, Paula has some control over the floppy drive control sort of things. I don't know, exactly know what, but there are some connections between Paula and Gary. Now the interesting thing with Gary, one of the things I was thinking is how does the ROM, the BIOS, you can't quite see it just down here, how does the output enable get controlled on that? Where's the address decoding for that on this system? And actually it comes from Gary. So yeah, if you've got a problem where your output enable's not being set, you know, it's not being pulled low for the you know system to be able to boot the CPU from that ROM, you need to look at Gary because you uh, it's an active low signal underscore ROM uh, EN, I think it is, uh, comes from there. I'll test that in a minute. Uh, I'll, from the, according to the diagram, it looks like ROM enables pin 12 on the, the, the ROM. We'll check that. Um, versus Gary. I'll do that in a sec. But Gary is primarily the floppy uh, disk drive controller. Um, you've got some bus control logic in there. I think there's an upper address line as well because remember, if you do um, a 1 meg chip upgrade, you know, so you, you stick. So you stick an expansion card in here of half a meg and you change the jumper or two to make that as chip enabled as chip RAM so you know to get a full one meg chip. One of the things you have to do is pull one of the connections from Gary somewhere, if I remember correctly. I might be getting confused and thinking about the uh, region mod. Because the other thing is there's a I think there's a, a pin somewhere around the Agnes here and it varies from revision to revision of Agnes. Controls whether it's uh, PAL or NTSC. So I could be getting confused there, but yeah, I'm pretty sure Gary has uh, one of the produces one of the upper address lines for the trapdoor memory there. I could be wrong. You've probably heard me mention them a number of times within videos uh, regard to serial. You've got a 1488 and a 1489, I think that one's the 1488. That, that one's the 1489. It's upside down, that one's a 1488. So yeah, a receiver and transmitter, you know, those pair there are used for the serial and it probably ultimately feeds through to Paula there. Um, but you've also got the CIAs here. The odd CIA, some of the floppy uh, stuff goes through here. I think actually the read signals I think might go through this. I could be mistaking it for that one. I just vaguely remember on one, one of the boards I looked at in the past, I had to fix a trace between Gary and there, or I think it was something like that, because uh, yeah, there was it was not it was given a read error all the time, and it was a bad trace on the CIA. Um, that one also is your parallel, your your odd one, uh, but also your keyboard and your joystick uh, mouse buttons as well. I think number one. The even CIA has got uh, serial control, so you know serial. You've not just got receive and transmit. There are other uh, you know handshake uh, connections and things, and that's probably all handled by that. Um, I don't think the receive and transmit goes through there. I think they say they come through here and straight through to there, strangely enough. So it's like you've got a fragmentation of some of the functionality, you know, a little bit of serial here, a little bit of serial there, etc. And it's the similar thing with a floppy drive, you know, a little bit here, a little bit here, and most of it here, kind of thing. Uh, and some parallel stuff by that. So again, it's like the, some of the parallel stuff is here, some of the parallel stuff is there. So yeah, it's strange how they fragmented things a little bit there. 
The data path stuff here sits between, as far as I can see from the schematics, the Agnes and the CPU. Um, there might be other things on the other side of that as well. Um, but the, uh, what have you got? You've got two four fours, which are just buffers. Uh, I can't see which of the two four fours now. Top ones there. They're two four fours. Um, and then these bottom ones are three seven three, so they're the latches. So I'm guessing it's kind of, it probably in, it works in a similar way that some of the stuff on the Neo Geo did, where you got these latches there, I, um, and the CPU can write to those latches, then maybe do other things in the system. I don't know, and then maybe the Agnes can pull the values from those latches. I suspect that's perhaps how those are used. We've covered most things, there's just some smaller chips here, you can see that these are used for the memory management related to the expansion stuff here I think. And then you've got a few smaller ICs here, somewhere there's a 555 timer, it's going to be here, can you see that reset, that's a 555 timer. But then you've just got a few smaller chips here, one of these might be an op amp or something, I'm not sure, but you've also got... Um, Standard Jelly Bean, you know, 7.4 logic. Some of which is used on, I think, some of the connections to Gary, some of the CIA stuff, etc. Just on the odd signal. The odd signal gets like anded or odd or something like that. You know, there's very little going on there. And these sort of things typically hardly ever fail. But you know, you can you can get problems with like I don't know, dead 555 and it not coming out of reset. So before I forget, I wanted to just test that ROM output enable just to be sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12. And if we just uh, test on Gary here, it's one of these top pins, I think. Yeah, there you go. Fourth pin down there. Um, so, yeah, the output enable comes from Gary. You've got some address decoding going on there um, for the control of the ROM. So, if you, you know, you see one of these where your output enable on your ROM is stuck high all the time, it's just not booting. You're looking at Gary. Yeah, I lost the footage uh, programming this. It's a long story, but you'll see in a following video what happened. Um, I had problems with the EEPROM programmer, but I used uh, a 27C400 equivalent. You can just about see there. It's a Toshiba TC54 something, I don't know. I can't be the partner, but yeah, 27C400 is what you need. Um, and then I nearly made the mistake of thinking this was a, a 27C1024 it needed where the output enables down here. It's not, it's uh, the 400, 27C400 because the output enables uh, pin 12. So in the next video we're going to look at a different board. I haven't actually finished with this board yet. Uh, the reason being is I cannot get access to my 500 and 500 plus. They're actually in the loft and there's a hell of a lot of boxes actually obscuring, you know, getting to them, stopping me from getting to them. So, uh, yeah, I, when I've got more time, you know, perhaps when I'm on leave or something, I can move some things around up there, have a bit of a clear out, and get my 500 and 500 plus down, and we can ha go inside those as well, because there's a few th things I want to do to those. So in terms of the state of this board, there is uh, some sort of minor issue with this at the moment. It seems to be a bit unstable. It might need recapping. It could be a RAM issue. It could be something in the data path area. I think. Uh, I mean, there's a chance one of these chips is a bit iffy. I don't think so. So we did have some bad connections on the socket and stuff. You know, there were some dirty uh, pins in some of the socket uh, connections there. Uh, and there were one or two traces around here that uh, ultimately, I think, were bad. I swapped out that resistor there. It was a bit of a more beefier one. I might revisit that because I've got some of the correct size now, perhaps in the next part. Um, but in the following video, you know, part two, it's going to be a different board, but we'll come back to this perhaps in part three. Anyway, I do hope you found the video interesting. Please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video.